everybody. Welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome back to my vampire recommendations series. This time I have decided to discuss and recommend contemporary stories to the original vampire novel Dracula by Bram Stoker. This time I have five stories to discuss. Now, some of these stories were published prior to Dracula and actually inspired Bram Stoker. Some were published afterwards and were inspired by Dracula. And one of them was actually published at the same time as Dracula, 1897. These stories display the origins of many of the staples of the vampire genre and make for excellent gothic tales. I can't wait to discuss and recommend them with all of you today. I will quickly note that a lot of these stories were published, obviously, in a different time period. So there was a lot of depictions of race, homophobia, and gender that would not fly today. So if anybody is off put by that, they obviously do not need to engage with any of these stories. But I will be acknowledging these problems and dealing with them in a proper way. So firstly, I will do a little discussion on the original novel Dracula by Bram Stoker. Dracula is an 1897 published novel by Bram Stoker, an Irish Gothic author. He was the manager at the Lyceum Theatre. He was the personal assistant to the actor Sir Henry Irving, and he wrote plenty of stories besides Dracula. I have a lot of them in here. A lot of Gothic tales. For those of you who don't really know about Dracula, it is an epistolary novel centering around the character Jonathan Harker and his circle of friends, as his job is to go to Transylvania to meet with Count Dracula and help him move to England. He then begins his reign of vampire terror, and Harker and his circle of friends, including Abraham Van Helsing, have to stop this guy from causing a lot of trouble. Now, I know this novel isn't going to be for everybody. It is very boggled down by description. It is very boring to have to read all of the characters' thoughts and their journals and whatever they're writing. And there is a lot of poorly executed action that sort of falls flat when you're expecting a heavily action-based novel from the events that happen in the story. What this book does well, in my opinion, is the slow buildup of the vampirism itself. It is incredibly slow, it is incredibly hopeless watching the victims of Dracula just slowly die or slowly become insane under his influence, and it is all very heavily sexualized, which I find quite thrilling. I really enjoy the characters in the novel, I enjoy the themes of the changing world, the introductions of new technologies, all the old world versus the new world, it is all very very interesting to me. And I adore one of the greatest characters of all time, Quincy the American Cowboy. Put Quincy in your Dracula adaptations, I'm starving here. <laughs> so I do recommend the novel if these sort of things interest you, however I do not make fun of the people who simply just want to watch a Dracula film adaptation and get the story that way. There are plenty of Dracula adaptations that successfully portray this tale, and they're great. A lot of the films condense the story into a more accessible medium, and I'm not going to judge anybody for preferring those. So that is Dracula by Bram Stoker. For the rest of the recommendations, I am going to be going in order of their publishing date. So the first vampire story I have to recommend today is The Vampire by John Polidori. This story was published in 1819. And for those who don't know, John Polidori was a doctor and a close friend, close friend, <coughs> to Lord Byron. And, fun fact, he was actually present during the time when Byron, Percy Shelley, and Mary Shelley all went to a house and decided to write ghost stories to pass the time. So Polidori was present at the time that Frankenstein by Mary Shelley was first conceptualized. So among the time that they all decided to write ghost stories, this was Polidori's story that he wrote. It is a very, very short story about the protagonist meeting the very charming vampire, Lord Ruthven, and figuring out that he is not who he appears to be. Another fun fact, Lord Ruthven was a nickname given to Lord Byron. 
So this story is heavily based on Lord Byron. This story is the origin of the term the Byronic Vampire, which is the charismatic gentleman with the monstrous facade underneath. You can tell Polidori had some issues with Byron. And when this story was originally published, it was misattributed to Byron. Byron was listed as the author. So goddamn Byron, you just gotta stop messing with Polidori. There is not a lot for me to say about the story itself because it is so short, but I do recommend it. It is one of the short stories that inspired basically all modern vampire fiction. There is always a Byronic vampire character, the one who just relishes in their vampirism and is all, you know, gentlemen and hiding and amongst the humans. So this is a very, very interesting story that I recommend, not just for its content, but for the very, very exciting history behind it. The next story was published the same year as The Vampire by Polidori, and that is The Black Vampire, attributed to the pen name Uriah Derek Darcy. This story is lesser known and was actually written as a response to Polidori's The Vampire. It is attributed as the first published story to feature a black vampire character. And we actually don't know who the author is. There is some theories on who it could be. The most popular ones are white European guys, but it is a very unique vampire short story featuring a black vampire. And the character himself is actually pretty morally gray. He does some evil things, but he also does some good things. I find the contents of the story itself to be just a little bit off-putting. It definitely wasn't for me. It is about a married couple who meet this black vampire, and he brings the husband back from the dead, and there's just not a lot going on plot-wise. I find the history of this novel as well to be much more engaging than the story itself. There are a lot of racial aspects that I find very, very yikes, but it does have a positive depiction of slave revolutions and arguing to abolish slavery. And it was written around the time of the Haitian Revolution and has a very positive attitude towards that. So, hey, it could be worse. While I didn't enjoy reading the story itself, it is a very important piece of vampire history and I couldn't just ignore it when discussing John Polidori's The Vampire. So, I recommend The Black Vampire by Uriah Derek Darcy in part at least for the very interesting history that comes along with it. Up next, we have the iconic lesbian story written by another Irish Gothic author that heavily inspired Stoker's own story. And that is J. Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, published in 1872. This short story is about a young woman named Laura who ends up meeting Carmilla and ends up living in her house and she is plagued by nightmares and weakness and being drained, and that only stops when Carmilla is defeated. This is just a beautifully written story, a lot of very cool, spooky tension. The author was known for writing ghost stories, and I love that this story is more of a creepy, spooky ghost story rather than a heavy, gory action-based story. Obviously, because of the time period that it was written in, it doesn't have the greatest view of lesbian romance or women romance in general, but... Hey, this story inspired the lesbian vampire film genre, for better or for worse. Listen, the only gay rep that we're going to get in the Victorian era is mostly negative, so why not imagine a better version of this story, right? You can just ignore all the heavily implied homophobia and just enjoy it as a tale of possession and obsession and women's love, you know? So... Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanu, a very important piece of vampire history and a story that heavily inspired Bram Stoker to write his own novel. For the final two stories, I do not have a copy of the novel, so you're just going to have to look at me as I talk about them. The next story I have to discuss is The Blood of the Vampire by Florence Marriott, which was actually published the same year that Dracula was, in 1897. This story is exciting because it is a female author writing a predominantly female cast of characters and featuring a female vampire. 
She is a proto-psychic vampire because there is no depiction of blood drinking on page. She is simply draining the energy of those around her. Think Colin Robinson from What We Do in the Shadows. She is... I'd say an energy vampire or a psychic vampire. This story is about a young new mother who ends up befriending a very young girl named Harriet and people around Harriet begin to slowly weaken and die and that's when she discovers she is an energy vampire. Now this story is almost entirely made up of high society interactions which can be unbearable for some people to read through and I understand that but I found myself heavily engaged with it because it was a, like I said, predominantly female cast of characters and they all had their own unique character traits. You found some of them unbearable and you felt bad for others. It was just a really well-balanced cast of characters. Many have compared this story to a sort of Jane Austen style of writing, so it is just a lot of polite interactions and conversations with people. Now, I will say that the reveal of Harriet to being a vampire is heavily racialized. It is explained that she is half black on, I believe, her mother's side, because she originally resided in Jamaica, and this reveal of her parentage also implies that she is evil because of her race. Stories written in this time period always have to have something, don't they? <sighs> but I believe this story is very interesting and unique for having the vampire be a metaphor for interacting with very draining people in polite society, which I'm sure was a very common thing at the time. And it's a female-led gothic story. It's a female-led classic. And I do highly recommend it as a very good piece of vampire history. I will warn there is a on-page depiction of infant death. It's not gory, but people who don't want to read that, I will warn that that is featured in the book. So read The Blood of the Vampire if you are interested in a, another female gothic vampire story. And the final story I have to recommend to you is the most complicated one, in my opinion, and that is The House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Virick published in 1907. Okay, here we go. This one's going to get a little bit wild. This story is about a main character named Ernest as he meets a gentleman named Reginald Clark, and he becomes utterly obsessed with him, and they end up sharing ideas about their art together. And then it's revealed that Reginald Clark is a psychic vampire who takes the ideas from those around him directly out of their heads and claims their ideas as his own, draining them in the process. This story is just excellently written. It is heavily inspired by Oscar Wilde and it shows on page. The beauty of the writing, the tension, the homoeroticism is all present and I was just so interested in the story. I could not put it down. I read it all in one go. It is another short story so that was easy to do but oh my gosh I loved it. I consider it one of my favorite vampire stories, period. Not just short stories, but out of all of them that I've read so far. But unfortunately, George Sylvester Virick was a advisor. Now, the story was written prior to everything that occurred in World War I and World War II, but his ideas are still heavily based in these beliefs, and we will have to discuss those, unfortunately. Luckily, I was able to gain access to an article in the book Open Graves, Open Minds, and it heavily discussed the notion of Virick and his not and its ties to this story, so I'm very thankful I was able to get access to it. I will read the title to you now. It is down here on page, so excuse me. It is called The Vampire as Dark and Glorious Necessity in George Sylvester Virick's House of the Vampire and Hans Hein Ewer's Wampir by Lisa Lampert Weising. I hope I said everything right. Everything I will discuss will be in citations in the description, and I'm very, very thankful that she wrote this paper so I could properly academically engage with this really, really, really bad thing. Now, she approached the vampire as a literary metaphor that specifically culturally embodies the political and historical contexts in which they were created. So we can't excuse or ignore the political context that comes with the ideas of the vampire. So within the story, Reginald Clark believes that he is doing good for the world, that he is 
taking ideas from other people, claiming them as his own, for the greater good of society. He is doing evil deeds for a greater cause. He is the Ubermensch. So these ideas link to the idea, which is not a good one, that the Nazis, they were doing stuff for the greater good, which they were not. Virik himself also argued that genius was a collective work and that the idea of being a genius was in itself vampiric because you absorb the ideas of others. Now for some background on Virik, he believed that Hitler was a genius and he actually interviewed him in 1923. He rallied support for the Germans during World War II prior to the U.S. intervention. But I failed to mention, he was a U.S. citizen. So this damaged his reputation, obviously. His contemporaries thought that this was a horrible idea, gross ideology, stupid, etc. He claimed not to be an anti-Semite, but he was heavily criticized for his support of Hitler. In fact, he was arrested in 1942 and put into prison. From 1942 to 1947, he blamed the professional Jews on this. Yuck. So, in his time period, he was heavily criticized, he was heavily, you know, proven wrong for these ideas and was actually arrested for them. So this story does not prove that his ideas were good and in his actual time period he was criticized for these ideas. So this story revealed his ideas that he thought that doing horrible things was for a greater good and his vampires show that that evil is justified which in itself is a very cool theme because it is an evil character. Now, I can still enjoy this story in spite of and acknowledging all of these known things about the author, but if you can't, that's totally fine. You do not need to. I can more easily do so because the author is dead. He's not financially gaining from these ideas. He was heavily criticized in his time, and I am not contributing any of these ideas further into society. As for authors who are still alive, that's a completely different case. So if you can't move past it, I completely understand, disregard this recommendation, but I still recommend the story for the work itself. I still very much enjoy it. So that's it. Those are my stories that I recommend that are contemporaries to Bram Stoker's Dracula, either inspiring him or being inspired by him. I hope you check out some of these stories and enjoy them as much as I did. If not, then the history behind them, which are way more interesting sometimes than the content themselves. Thank you so so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you're interested. I plan on doing more vampire recommendation videos in this series, so look forward to those. Thank you so so much for watching. Have an excellent day or night, and I will see you all next time. Bye bye! And I thought I'd show off the shirt. Thought it was very appropriate given the content that we're discussing. <laughs>